It's always a pleasure for me to speak to the San Diego friends of Jung. It, it, always, it feels like home. It feels like speaking to my own family. So much of my own work, so ma many of the books that Gil referred to really began as lectures here when I presented my first tentative explorations of themes that eventually issued in those books. So I'm very happy to be here once again. I also want to begin this evening by saying that in my heart, in my soul, I'm dedicating what ha what's happening here this evening to Andrew S. Seisman, a 30-year-old friend and former student who died earlier this week of AIDS. And the reason I'm doing that is that I see Andy as embodying the archetype of the wounded healer, which is the theme, of course, of my presentation tonight. And, and until a few weeks ago, this young man was really the most zestful, life-loving person I've known. And it's very hard for me to acknowledge, to recognize that he's no longer among us. Andy had been a physician for all his adult life. And when he first fell ill four years ago, he resigned from his position as a Kaiser emergency room physician and soon became nationally prominent in a unique role. He was a doctor uh, involved with the, the AIDS, act, a doctor with AIDS who was actively involved with ACT UP, the gay rights protest group. And he spent a lot of time encouraging other doctors to support its campaigns for accelerated AIDS research and for making the fruits of that research available and affordable. And I can't think of how many times during these last few years he spoke of feeling that it's in this activity where he was bringing together AIDS patients, which he was, and doctors, which he also was, uh, how many times he spoke of feeling that since his own diagnosis, he'd found himself doing what he was born to do, fully using all his gifts and talents more than he'd ever before been able to do as he put his energies into this unique role of being a kind of intermediary between the physicians and the researchers on the one hand and persons with AIDS on the other. And I just want to bring him here into our midst today because it seems so obvious to me that in Andy, his wound and his healing were inextricably intertwined. So now into my talk, Only the Wounded Healer Heals, the Testimony of Greek Mythology. That woundedness, illness, suffering, are a prerequisite for taking on the role of healer is a truth recognized in the myths and rituals of traditional cultures throughout the world. It underlies the shamanic vision of the healer in Siberia, North America, Africa, and Australia. Everywhere we learn that initiation into healing comes through falling radically ill of a disease that cannot be diagnosed and for which there seems to be no cure. And then recovery comes only when the patients recognize the illness as a call, only when they agree to become healers. The woundedness is understood to signify that their very being wounded in the first place is understood as signifying an unusual sensitivity to the spirit world the realm of visionary experience, which unless this sensitivity is used on behalf of others, will destroy the individual who has it. So the apprentice shamans have then to learn how to use their access to that realm to channel their gifts and bring them into harmony with their particular culture's traditions. When others fall ill, the shamans re-enter the strange and terrifying other world to learn whom their patients have offended and what retribution they must make or how to recover their stolen soul. The persisting power of this image of the wounded healer and its relevance to our contemporary understanding of soul healing 
that is of psychotherapy, was revealed to me by a dream. And reflection on this theme still always conjures up for me remembrance of this particular dream. Though this is a dream dreamt long ago and not by me. The dreamer was a woman friend in Jungian training, actually a woman whom some of you in this room know very well because she eventually came to San Diego and became a Jungian analyst here, Jan Clanton. At the time she dreamt, had this dream, she was still at the very beginning of her own training back in New York. And at that time, that she, she dreamt that she and her training analyst were together undertaking the exploration of an undersea world. They were making their way through all of the fantastically beautifully colored coral and other plants that grow deep at the bottom of the sea. All about them were brilliantly tinted fish and other wondrously strange inhabitants of the sea. And the passage was a difficult one. They knew it was important to make their way without brushing against the fatally poisonous coral and without disturbing the living creatures whose world they'd entered. My friend's hands clasped her analyst's ankles as he led the way through the unfamiliar terrain. She found herself utterly trusting his guidance, confidently following his lead. Until, you know there's going to be an until, right? Until suddenly he made a turn which seemed to push her directly against a sharp piece of coral. The wound was deep and began to bleed. Soon after, they emerged from the water. Feeling utterly betrayed, she turned to him and asked, could you let that happen to me? Only the wounded healer heals, he replied. And as I say, that dream of Jan's is always for me, comes up whenever I reflect on this particular theme. And I think these words reverberate because they're confirmed by my own experience. Only the wounded healer heals. I know that it's my own fragility and vulnerability my own experiences of overwhelming depression, of what I can only call loss of soul. For one of its most painful dimensions was, when I really went through this most deeply, was that for months in me, that in me which dreams seemed to have died. It's these kinds of experiences I know that underlie whatever power I have as a teacher or a healer. I understand how essential it is to know the experience of woundedness from within in order to learn to trust the process. How important it is to have discovered that such experiences have intrinsic meaning, though they are not the only reality. To know that one returns from them, although not unchanged. I've also learned that healing often involves wounding, as in that dream that the teacher may often need to reveal her students' ignorance and heighten their confusion. The therapist may often need to uncover hidden pain, to take apart carefully wrought defenses as part of her work. Freud and Jung, the two healers of the soul of our time from whom I've learned the most, both clearly knew of this complex interrelationship between wounds and healing. Freud was really initiated into his depth understanding of the psyche by the death of his father, by the painful discovery in the months that followed that death of the murderous resentment and unrelenting rivalry he had felt since childhood toward this parent whom he also knew he loved. It was attending to the isolating depression and the disruptive dreams that preoccupied him during the next few years that led him to acknowledge, I am my own most difficult patient. Through the exploration of his own patienthood, Freud came to recognize the woundedness of all of us. He came to believe that it is not only the neurotics or psychotics among us who are ill, for to participate in civilization, as all humans must, is to be deeply discontent, diseased, 
inevitably restrained from true fulfillment of some of our most powerful longings. As a healer, Freud could aid the transition from hysteric misery to common unhappiness. He could offer sympathy, understanding, courage, but not cure, not the elimination of our woundedness. In one of his last essays, one of my favorites really, Analysis Terminable and Interminable, Freud acknowledges how even after a long sustained analysis, we patients are changed and yet in another sense still the same. And he suggests that the most important task in analysis is the acceptance of our finitude, our limitations, and preparation for our death. Jung's call came by way of, the of what I think of as the symbolic death of his symbolic father, that is, by way of his break with Freud. This led him into those years of psychotic-like immersion in the unconscious, which he reports so vividly in that confrontation with the unconscious chapter of Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Later, in his paper, Psychology of the Transference, Jung reaffirms how important it is that therapists remember the experiences of woundedness that led them to become involved in therapy to begin with, that they stay in touch with that memory, and that they remain open to further wounding. Jung, you remember, believes in the mutuality of transference. In the therapeutic relationship, as he lays it out, Therapists, too, get involved in a transformative process that, like their patients, they may often find difficult, confusing, and painful. Effective therapy depends on the therapist's readiness to risk being hurt in the process and changed by it, and their willingness to communicate that readiness. Jung also speaks of the importance of healing healers remembering that they, too, are wounded in order to protect themselves from the danger of inflation, the danger of being pulled into an identification with their healing role. How much depends on our remembering that we are not only healers, but also wounded. The wounded healer is thus not only a figure who appears in other traditions, but one that has played an important role in the history of 20th century depth psychology. The frequent reemergence of the image suggests that it's an archetype. In the everyday sense of a spontaneously reappearing image, not necessarily in the strictly Jungian sense of a universal a priori figure. An image which informs the work of healers whether or not they or their patients are fully aware of its influence. Thus, the more aware we are of just what this image represents, of just what this figure of the wounded healer is like, the more likely we are to recognize its role in our own experience. Not surprisingly, the figure of the wounded healer plays an important role in Greek mythological traditions about healers, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on for the rest of this lecture. It is these traditions that I want to examine here. For rich and illuminating as other traditions may be, it remains true that for those of us raised in the dominant culture of the West, the images that lie deep in our language and literature, and I think probably in our psyches too, derive from Greece. We may be surprised to discover that what we individually have first found elsewhere can also be found here. Indeed, as I imagine many of you know, most of our language for healing comes from Greece. And words that we may often use carelessly and one-dimensionally still carry within them echoes of ancient assumptions resonant with ritual significance. Medicine, for example, the word medicine, may be related to the ancient mythological sorceress Medea, who claimed to have the power to restore youthfulness, and to the fearful Gorgon Medusa, whose blood was used by Asclepius, the god of healing, that I'm going to be spending quite a bit of time on later in the lecture. 
uh, Medea, whose blood was used by Asclepius to restore life to the dead. Pharmacy comes from pharmacos, the designation for a ritual substitute victim, a scapegoat. Therapist comes from the Homeric therapone, one who takes on the suffering and death due another, as Patroclus in the Iliad took on the destiny of Achilles, or one who receives his essence from another, as Hesiod, the epic poet, received his inspiration, his poetic gift from the muses. And the word therapist comes more directly from the word designating an attender upon the sacred a priest, the Greek word being therapeute. Again and again, I have found Greek mythology profoundly illuminative of human experience. The Greek goddesses have taught me much about the multidimensionality and complexity of female experience and power. The Greek heroines have deeply enriched my understanding of the subtle intricacies of sister-sister bonding. I value especially how the polytheistic assumptions of this tradition reveal how manifold are the ways, in one, the ways in which one may be a mother or a sister or a wounded healer. There are many different figures and stories, male healers and female healers. Yet in all these stories in Greek mythology, in each healing, in each healing and woundedness, and often the inflicting of wounds as well, seem to be closely intertwined. In the religious healing tradition of ancient Greece, it was assumed that the God who can heal is the one responsible for the wounding in the first place. So the sufferer has to first discover which deity he's offended, which one has made him ill, and what ritual acts must be undertaken in order to be purified or healed. Plato tells us that the Coriobantes, the male attendants of the mother goddess Kabele, diagnosed illness by attending to the patient's response to music. If patients responded to music associated with Hecate, then it was she whom they must appease. If the songs associated with Dionysus produced catharsis, then this was the god by whom they'd been possessed. Thus, ritual healing was based on what we might call homeopathic assumptions. The agent of wounding and healing are one. The Greeks also believed, and I think you'll see this as I go on, that the deities had themselves discovered, had themselves suffered, rather, what they might impose on others. Until the 4th century BCE, rational and religious approaches to healing were assumed to be complementary. After that, influenced by Plato's radical separation of soul from body, and Aristotle's radical separation of intuitive and imaginal consciousness from reason, this was no longer true. The rational approach to illness henceforth concerned itself with abstract postulates concerning the variety of diseases and their causes, as for instance in Galen's theory of the four humors, rather than with the treatment of patients. So, and at this point where the rational approach and the religious approach to healing diverge, both really become very, very weakened because the rational approach is just into kind of theories about healing and the religious approach de generates into superstitious reliance on magical remedies. But earlier, in the strata of Greek thought represented by ancient myth and preserved in the 8th century epic traditions and in the lyric and tragic poetry of the classical period, reason was seen as including imagination. Mind and body were understood as inextricably intertwined, and the gods were believed to be at work in human affairs. In the pre-Socratic world, medical practitioners were craftsmen who worked for their livelihood with their hands and thus were of low social status. Like singers and builders, they were often itinerant, wanderers, and always welcome foreigners. They were initiated into their craft through an oral apprenticeship. 
because the Greeks saw the processes of the natural world as themselves divine. They didn't see any disjunction between natural cures on the one hand and supernatural ones on the other, nor any disjunction between, in this period, between rational and religious approaches to healing. So that to Hippocrates, who was a contemporary of Socrates, a physician was still a servant. A physician was a therapeute whose concern was directed primarily to the healing of patients rather than to the study of disease syndromes. Hippocrates believed that the appropriate source of medical knowledge is not abstract speculation, but clinical practice. Uh, and central to his ethos of responsible medicine was recognizing the limits of one's knowledge and refraining from interference when one was ignorant. Hippocrates saw temple medicine as the appropriate last resort when the physician's knowledge had been exhausted. Physician and priest thus were regarded as allies. Asclepius was invoked by both religious healers and by these crafts physicians. And Hippocrates came to be seen as the son of Asclepius, that is, as his human agent and he in turn passed his wisdom down to his sons. And later, all physicians came to be seen as adoptive sons of Hippocrates and as Asclepius. The Greek conception of the divine was polytheistic and hierarchical. All aspects of human experience were associated with at least one of the 12 Olympians, the 12 major deities though minor deities might be assigned domain over some particular area. The major Greek deity associated with healing is Apollo. And I think that to really understand how Apollo is related to healing means letting go of some of our superficial understanding of what Apollo is like. It means letting go of our tendency to identify Apollo with dispassionate abstraction, with formal perfection, with invulnerable self-sufficiency. That is, it means going behind Nietzsche's heuristic contrast between Apollo and Dionysus, which sees those deities as opposite. And means also going behind seeing only the Apollo associated with Delphi to older, more complex representations. Now we're talking this evening primarily about the wounded healer. And I have to be honest and admit that I don't know of any tale in which Apollo is literally wounded. But there are many which portray his distress at the death of young beloveds like Hyacinthus or Cyparissus. And Apollo, there's another also in which Apollo received a serious wounding in his dignity as a god. When in punishment for killing the Cyclops, who had made the thunderbolts with which Zeus killed Apollo's son Asclepius, and we'll talk more about that story later on. Uh, in punishment for Apollo's killing those Cyclops, Zeus sentenced Apollo to a year's stint as servant of a mortal king, Alcestis. And indeed, some say that Apollo served Alcestis not only as servant, but as an Arimanos, that is, as a receptive partner in a homosexual relationship, which, from the Greek perspective, would be, believe me, an even more radical loss of status than just being a servant to a mortal. The year with Alcestis represented a year of purification. The connection to our theme of wounded healer may be more evident if we remember that from the Greek perspective, pollution and wound are homologous realities. But the recognition of Apollo as a healer seems to proceed more from his being a wounding than a wounded god. Uh, Apollo's arrows brought disease and swift death to men 
as his sister Artemis's arrows were held responsible for women's deaths not caused by visible violence. A few years ago, almost by chance, my partner River and I were in Greece and we were driving through Arcadia and we saw a sign to a temple that our particular guidebook hadn't written about at all. It said the Temple of Bassi. So we drove up this long, long winding road up to a serenely beautiful, isolated, and very rarely visited mountaintop temple at Bassi, which was dedicated to Apollo as the god who sends and banishes illness, the god of plague and healing. This was a temple that had been built by the faraway town of Phig Figalea in gratitude for Apollo's finally bringing an end to a plague that he himself had sent. Uh, I think it's also interesting that the sculpture known as the Apollo Belvedere is a Roman copy of a statue initially made in response to another community seeking to bring an end to a similar devastation. And as they were trying to figure out what to do so Apollo would stop making things so difficult for them, uh, they were told, erect a statue to Apollo, which they did, and then the plague was lifted. As Apollo eventually, in the course of Greek cultic history, came to be identified primarily with the temple at Delphi, his work as healer comes more and more to be accomplished through his oracular activity. There's a tradition according to which Apollo had wrested control, taken control of the Delphi oracle from the primordial earth mother goddess Gaia by killing the snake, the python, that she had established there at the oracle as its guardian. Originally, the oracle at Delphi had probably been an incubational oracle. That is, the petitioners received the directions they thought through Gaia-sent dreams. In Apollo's time, the female seers, called Pythia, responded to the seeker's questions. Now, scholars still disagree as to whether the Pythia's utterances were frenzied and monadic, requiring interpretation by male priests, or, though dramatic and poetic, clear enough to be appropriate directly by the petitioners without the need for such intermediaries. They're agreed, however, as to the uniqueness of this oracle, which depended neither on dreams nor on physical signs like animal entrails or stars, and which relied for generations on the inspiration of a single person holding a permanent office at a designated site. To this oracle, to Apollo's oracle at Delphi, came those who sought to know how they may purify themselves or their city. Consultation of the oracle represented an attempt at a rational approach to the resolution of suffering. One came to learn the source of one's pollution and its remedy. Yet, as I imagine all of you remember, the ant, this is supposed to be this whole rational thing, and yet the answers that the petitioners received were cryptic, and usually one's first or even second interpretation of what action they directed was wrong. Following the oracle often made things worse before it made them better. Full understanding of Apollo's role as healer also requires attending to him as the leader of the muses. The still beautifully preserved theater at Epidaurus is dedicated to him. And that same summer that River and I went to Basai, we watched a performance in that theater of Aeschylus' The Seven Against Thebes, a simple, powerful retelling of sibling hatred and love. Two brothers, so estranged from one another that neither can bear to have the other live, and by killing one another. Their two sisters are committed to giving each brother the ritual recognition due the dead, though the state has decreed that one is a hero deserving ceremonial burial 
and the other a traitor whose body should be left to the dogs and vultures. As I watched this play, I understood again how Asclepius's visionary appearance says to the patients who came to him for healing in the temple close by, and the tragedians' revisionings of how the divine enters our life to wound and to heal are clearly intertwined. I also felt as I was watching that play that I understood really better than I had before why Freud took over that word catharsis, which is originally Aristotle's word for that purging of our fear and terror that vicarious participation in the enacted suffering of others can affect, that Freud took over that word catharsis to describe how the emotional and not just intellectual remembrance of our own most painful memories can issue in release. The theater as well as the temple are relevant to an understanding of the art of healing. Apollo's power to heal was also associated with the paean the healing song, the hymn sung in gratitude for healing or for success in battle. Before it referred to the song, the name had been an epithet of Apollo. But before that, Paeon was an independent deity, himself a god, the healer among the gods, the healer of the gods, a god who supposedly healed two immortals, Ares and Hades, two of the gods, of wounds so dreadful that no mortal could possibly have survived them. Ares, the god of war, had been wounded at Troy at Athena's urging, and crying in pain, he fled to Olympus, where he received no sympathy from Zeus, who let him know that the injury was but, just the, co but the just consequence of his own mindlessly destructive bloodlust. But of course, since Ares is a god, he must not die. And so he was sent to Paeon for healing. Hades, god of the underworld, received his wound from a poisoned arrow shot by Heracles. And the excruciating, unremitting pain of this wound led him to leave his dark underworld domain as he did on only one other occasion, the time he came up to abduct Persephone. He left at this time to go to Paon to be cured by the physician god. Now we can understand that Paon, the god who heals the gods, might be an unwounded healer. But Paon is available only to the gods. For mortals, only healers who are themselves vulnerable avail. Remembrance that we are mortal and not divine is a prerequisite to receiving healing from Apollo. In his realm, healing depends upon true knowledge of our situation. We must remember that Apollo's famous dictum, know thyself, meant not, as we sometimes take it to mean, know the truth about your individual personal history, but rather simply know thyself in Apollo's world meant remember that you are mortal. The God of healing remains the God associated with death. And among the Hyperboreans with whom Apollo spent the three months of winter each year, life was miraculously prolonged and death when it came was easy, euthanasia. It was for such a death that one might invoke Apollo. Now Apollo, like all the major deities, was a god associated with many realms, not only healing. Though his particular way of being a healer, as I've tried to suggest, is integrally related to his other functions and attributes. But often, it is among members of the next generation, among the children of the Olympians, that we find more specialized divinities. And thus, it is Apollo's son, Asclepius, who becomes preeminently the god of healing, a god whose whole energy is devoted to this one function. 
His power as a healer is seen as deriving from his father. So that even at Epidaurus, the site most identified with Asclepius, his temple is built above the ruins of an ancient Apollo temple, and the Asclepian sanctuary, which is in a gentle, peaceful valley, was in classical times overlooked by an, an Apollo temple erected on the hilltop far above. Once long ago, as Apollo Maliatus, Apollo himself had healed the sick by visiting them in their dreams. But as Apollo became more and more the, the Apollo of Delphi, such visitations came to seem incongruous. Now it's another god, his son, who makes such nocturnal appearances. As is so often the case in mythology, the story of Asclepius' birth encapsulates much of who he is. He was the issue of a love affair between Apollo and a beautiful mortal woman named Coronis. She was a granddaughter of Ares, god of war, and a sister of Ixion, the first human murderer. So this genealogy immediately brings together these motifs of healing and death. According to the most oft-cited version, when Coronis discovered she was pregnant, was carrying Apollo's child, she decided to find a mortal man who might wed her and give her child legitimacy. Other later traditions represent her marriage as forced upon her by her father or show her as victim of Ischias's seduction. Uh, but the main story really simply suggests that uh, Coronis is hoping to have a father who's going to, a husband who's going to be around <laughs> to father her child, as Apollo clearly wouldn't be. But anyway, Apollo affronted that any woman might prefer a human husband to a divine lover, sends Artemis to kill Coronis, and the bridesmaid assembled for the wedding, and he himself kills the groom. Unwilling to have his as yet unborn son die in this holocaust, Apollo, acting as a surgeon and midwife, cuts open his dying mistress's womb to rescue the almost full-term child. And thus, Asclepius is born, the first caesarean, it is sometimes jokingly said, saved from death so that he might grow up to heal others. Asclepius was sent to be raised by Chiron, the wise centaur who was a teacher also to Jason, Achilles, and Actaeon. The centaurs were a race of creatures with the bodies of horses and shoulders. The bodies of ho the bodies, yeah, the bodies of horses, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. And the shoulders and heads of men who were descended from Apollo or perhaps from Ixion, were wild and fearful. But this particular centaur, Chiron, had a different genealogy because he, like Zeus and many of the Olympians, was a child of Kronos, and he was wise and gentle. In his case, in Chiron's case, his half-human, half-animal kind of nature seemed to signify an attunement to instinctual wisdom and a deep understanding of embodiment, an understanding which informed his gift as hunter, sculptor, and healer. And unlike the other centaurs, Chiron was an immortal. But during the course of Heracles' battle against the centaurs, Chiron was inadvertently wounded by, the arrow, by an arrow of the hero, an arrow like the one that wounded Hades, which was dipped in the poisonous gout of the Hydra, whom Heracles had killed long before. And this wound that Chiron received was deep and painful. It would not heal. Indeed, so unremitting was his distress that Chiron came to regret an immortality from which he could not escape. <laughs> One senses that the incurably wounded centaur's gifts as healer 
were shaped by his own ineluctable fate. And I have to say that whenever I reflect on this Greek mythological image, I always find myself thinking of Freud. And Freud in those last 16 years of his life, when he was tormented unceasingly by his cancer of the jaw, and yet continued to practice and to write. I've come to recognize that for a long while, when I thought of the wounded healer, I really had in mind the healed healer, the once wounded healer, whose wounds were now healed. Chiron represents our an integral part of our being, which means not that being wounded is true health, but rather that acceptance of our wounds is part of true health, as is acceptance that some wounds heal and some do not. A glance at Chiron's other, I don't think I should take the time to do that. Um, the, other, the other heroes whom Chiron taught also, were, also became healers in various ways, but I really want to focus on Asclepius. The others gave or received healing in the course of their exploits as warriors or hunters, whereas Asclepius dedicated his life to healing. In recognition of his gifts as a physician, Athena shared with Asclepius the vials of blood collected from the wound made when Perseus severed the Gorgon Medusa's head from her body. And the blood which dripped from the left vein was a magically potent poison. But the blood which had dripped from Medusa's right vein was reputed to have the power to restore the dead to life. And so the stories go, on several occasions, perhaps in sympathetic remembrance of his mother's unjust death, Asclepius used the magic potion to bring back to life heroes that he thought had been unjustly punished by the gods and prematurely sent to their death, to Hades. There's, the stories vary as to just who benefited from this gift, but among those who are most often mentioned, we find Orion, Hippolytus, Caponaeus, Lycurgus. There's, what, there is no dispute, however, though, is about Zeus's anger at Asclepius's presumption in transgressing what was really from the Greek perspective the boundary between humanity and the gods. Men are mortal, only the gods are free from death. And in punishment for this unforgivable crime, Zeus struck Asclepius with his thunderbolts and sent him to Hades so that he, though a god, might himself experience the fate of mortals. And it was Apollo's anger at this uh, further unjust punishment <laughs> that led Apollo to kill the thunderbolt forging Cyclops, the story that I referred to before. Thus, Asclepius becomes the only god in Greek mythology to experience death. For the Greeks, then, the god of healing, the preeminent god of healing, is a god, is the only god, who knows what it is to die. Uh, though as a god, his stay in Hades is only temporary. Though as a god, he can experience mortality without forfeiting his immortality. It is nonetheless his own experience of vulnerability to death that made him seem to the Greeks a god more kindly, more benevolent than any other. There are other figures in Greek cult who died and were then worshipped as having healing power, but they were mortal heroes whose power derived precisely from their having died and now living in the underworld. Their powers were underworld powers, phonic powers, and localized. Worshippers came to their tombs to consult with the dead or for healing. 
But although there may be disagreement, there is disagreement among scholars as to whether Asclepius was always a god or was initially a hero who later became a god, it is clear that his cult from the beginning was not a phonic hero's cult. There are no references ever to Asclepius being worshipped at a tomb, nor to his power being available only at a single localized site. Now, as a god who had spent time in the underworld, it's not surprising that Asclepius was seen as a participant in Persephone's mysteries, as an initiate of Aloysius. The god of healing, through his experience of underworld reality, came to understand his work as subordinate to Persephone's. Remember, she's the goddess of the underworld, the goddess of the realm of the dead. Though not himself an underworld deity, he urges those who come to him to offer prayers to Demeter and Persephone. Because Asclepius can save one from death now, but not for good. The respite his healing provides give those who are not yet ready for death an interval to prepare for the death that still inevitably lies ahead. The healing of the body that Asclepius makes possible gives us time to attend to the health of our souls. Those who sought Asclepius' aid believe that if the god refuses to heal, it means that the time for one's death has come. And sometimes, of course, death is a release from illness. Thus, there was a shrine to Asclepius at Aloysius, but his own cult center was at Epidaurus, and the rituals there were different from those at any other Greek temple site. For this god was available to the individual whenever his aid was sought. His temple was open every day, not only on designated ritual occasions. Though not a sonic hero associated with the underworld, Asclepius was also not an Olympian. He was a god who stayed on earth. Those who came to Epidaurus were the hopeless cases, patients who had exhausted the medical resources of their own communities, who knew they were threatened with death and felt they were not yet ready. One went through the ritual at Epidaurus alone. It was not a communal event as the rites associated with other gods were. First, there were three days of ritual preparation, fasting, bathing, sacrificial offerings to Asclepius and Apollo, and to, the God, to, the, to, to memory, the mother of the muses, Maybe the prayers to her expressed one's hope of being remembered. And to Tyche, success. Then, after those three days of preparation, dressed in one's ordinary clothes, one was led by a therapeut, that is an attendant of the god, to a small stone chamber. Empty except for a simple stone sleeping platform, a climb, which is the origin of our word clinic a space one might often have visited in daylight during the time of preparation. Then even the attendant withdrew to leave one alone with one's dreams and with the God. After offering a prayer to Thamus, right order, one settled oneself down to sleep directly on the stone rather than on animal skins as in the incubation rites associated with the heroes in hope that the god himself would come as one dreamt. The Greeks believed that when we sleep, our psyche, that in us which is quiescent during active, conscious waking life, becomes active. It is the psyche that dreams and that persists after the death of our bodies and lives on in Hades. Psyche represents the core of our individual being, our personal es essence, the aspect of the patient that will encounter the god. The psyche, as the Greeks understood this, sees dreams. It receives them. Dreams are God-sent, are theophanies, are appearances of the gods. And in the Asclepian ritual, the god's appearance in one's dream was understood as itself the healing event. 
the gods coming to one in the dream marked that always hidden transition between illness and the beginning of the return to health. Every cure was a divine act, a mystery, which could only happen in the dark. At Epidaurus, unlike Delphi, it was the patient who had the healing vision rather than a priest or a priestess or a pythoness. At Epidaurus, unlike Delphi, the vision itself accomplished the cure. There was no need for interpretation nor for action based on the dream's prescription. Though in a later period, uh, at Epidaurus and especially at the Asclepian Shrine on the island of Kos, run by Hippocratic physicians, uh, the dreams may have been understood more like other oracles as providing prescriptions for treatment rather than affecting the cure directly. But in the classical period, the dream was the cure. In the patient's dream, the god might appear in his human-like form or theriomorphically, as a snake or as a dog. Many of the recorded dreams describe a snake or a dog licking the afflicted part and thus healing it. Barren women who'd come in the hopes of, to Epidaurus in the hopes of getting pregnant told of dreams in which a snake appeared and copulated with them. Snakes were, of course, associated also with many of the goddesses and with phonic religiosity. As in so many other religious traditions, the snake was seen as emblematic of that mysterious relationship between death and rebirth. Dogs, too, were associated by the Greeks with underworld experience. You may remember that three-headed Cerberus welcomes the dead to Hades, but eats those who try to leave, and that night-roaming Hecate is accompanied by baying hounds, the restless spirits of those not given ritual burial. And when the god appeared in dreams as a human-like physician, he acts on the pattern of a human-like physician, his cures are medical cures. In the dreams, he was seen as applying salves, making use of drugs, and operating. Though his procedures were often contrary to human theories of treatment, and his surgeries often more radical than any mortal hero might dare undertake. Dreaming, the patient was alone with the god. In the morning, the therapeut returned to the sleeping chamber to record the dream. Only that, though the patient's retelling may no doubt have had some salutary effect. And in that retelling, the dream, through what Freud calls secondary elaboration, may quite unconsciously have been subtly revised to accord with the culturally expected dream pattern. Afterwards, the patient would offer a song of praise, a paean, in gratitude for what he had been given and would sacrifice a rooster to the god as token that daylight has overcome the dark, health has overcome disease. Despite his recognition of the ultimate power of the underworld deities, Asclepius remains a son of Apollo, dedicated to life on the sunlit earth, to the never ultimately victorious struggle against death. Now, most of the traditions associated with Asclepius focus on his role as healer. He had a wife, Epione, whose name, like the last part of his own, derives from a word meaning mild. But there are no stories about their relationship. Homer names two sons, two warrior physicians who were among the Greek forces at Troy. Uh, well, maybe I'll do this anyway. Um, Machaon, the slaughterer, is spoken of as the first surgeon. After his own fatal wounding and death on the battlefield, he had a hero's tomb, which served as a cult site. His brother, Pod Podolaris, could treat invisible illnesses, including those of the soul, psychic wounds, like the madness of Ajax and the paranoid isolation of Philoctetes. Asclepius' other children appear more as figures of allegory than of true myth. They include Iaso, whose name, meaning healing, 
uh, is close to that of the Argonaut hero, Jason, who was one of those uh, students of Chiron. Another son, Panacea, Panacea, Cure. Uh, another one, Telesphoros, whose name means completion. And a daughter, Hygeia, hygiene, health. The Greeks still toast Iaso as they drink their wine. Telesara, it was represented as a kind of dwarf-like nocturnal figure, may have been associated with the completion represented by death. Hygeia was a drink imbibed in gratitude for one's cure. It may have had psychedelic properties. There aren't any stories about Hygeia. She exists as little more than a name. Yet she was said to be the one daughter worth as much as all the sons. And there is a lovely sculpted head of her in the National Museum of Athens, which communicates healing power. Her face, I imagine many of you have seen a photograph or a copy of this sculpted head. Uh, her face is calm, serene, her gaze direct and gentle. And there are reliefs of Hygeia in the museum at Epidaurus and in other places as well, which show her accompanying Asclepius. Often, these reliefs are very interesting because often they show her standing commandingly while Asclepius sits. And sometimes she is larger than he. Sometimes she appears in the guise of an enormous snake. So there are suggestions in these artistic representations that maybe he gets his power from her, that perhaps healing was originally associated with the goddess, not the god. Perhaps she was originally seen as a giver and preserver of health, and Asclepius as only a healer of the ill. If so, hers would have been seen as the greater gift in a culture where health was viewed as the greatest boon and old age as a burden. We do know that in later periods, the emphasis in the Asclepian cult fell on rituals for the healthy, not for the sick. So the iconographic evidence may preserve ancient traditions about the health-giving goddess. But according to the literary evidence, Hygeia is a minor figure, a daughter without attribute or story, a wounded healer in that prototypically feminine sense of being devalued, almost invisible. To discover more illuminating Greek mythological representations of female healing power, we must look at the traditions about the major goddesses. Long before there are any extant evidences of a particular divinity called Hygeia, Hygeia was an attribute of Athena. Athena, as the goddess of all craftspeople and artisans, was the goddess of physicians. The divinity most associated with the life of the polis, the community, she was dedicated to serving the health of the community, of individuals as citizens. In this goddess of practical wisdom, the Greeks expressed their belief that rationality, thought, rationality, was itself sacred and divine. Thus, Athena helps us to understand that for the Greeks, there's no conflict between rational and religious healing. To use our minds for the sake of our shared life is a religious act. Athena also represents a valuation of how reflection may serve to protect us from being overwhelmed by our instincts, our fears, our impetuosity, our enthusiasms. Though it's not difficult to discern Athena's relation to healing, it is at first glance not easy to see her relevance to the theme of the wounded healer. Yet we must recall that Athena wears Medusa's severed head on her aegis, that her pharmacopoeia includes the vial of healing blood gathered from Medusa's right artery and the vial of death-bringing poison gathered from the left. In Athena, Medusa's fearful, petrifying gaze has been reshaped into a power to restore order. That which is most fearsome, most threatening about female energy has in her been transformed, 
sublimated, made healing. Another important female goddess of healing is Hera in her aspect as midwife, an aspect evident in more concentrated form in her daughter, Ilithea, as Apollo's healing is evident in more concentrated form in his son, Asclepius. Hera is an obviously wounded goddess, wounded in what is at the very center of her existence, her marriage. Hera is wife, wife betrayed over and over again by unfaithful Zeus, Wife is possessive, jealous, and vengeful, and she is sympathetic towards all other suffering wives, but cruel towards the women with whom Zeus makes love, regardless of how violently they may have sought to avert his advances. In the literary representations of Hera, written, as we know, from male perspectives, Hera becomes an epitome of the wounded healer whose own woundedness distorts her exercise of her healing gifts. And I think it's important to remember that that can happen. Our woundedness can further our healing, but it also uh, can distort it. Uh, Hera refuses to allow Ilithea to go to the aid of Leto as she struggles painfully for nine days to give birth to Apollo. And when Heracles' mother's birth pangs begin, Hera sends Ilithea to bind her legs together to delay his birth, thereby assuring that another child will be born as heir to the kingdom that otherwise would have been Heracles. The evidences we have of women's rituals dedicated to Hera present a different picture, emphasize her helpfulness, but her, perhaps the women wanted to be sure she would be helpful to them. Or perhaps they saw her as an advocate against unfaithful husbands. Childbirth was a women's mystery. The preeminent god of healing, god, the preeminent god of healing, male god of healing, Asclepius, explicitly excluded women about to give birth from his sanctuary. So the god of healing was not a midwife god. Uh, Midwifery was definitely a women's mystery, and because of that, it's not surprising that there was more than one goddess associated with this central aspect of female experience. Thus, not only Hera, but also Artemis was a midwife goddess, uh, and Artemis did not share Hera's prejudices. Goddess of woods and wilderness, herself a virgin without children of her own, Artemis came to the aid of all females struggling to give birth. As in her own infancy, she had immediately after her own birth turned to help her mother in her difficult struggle to give birth to Artemis' twin, Apollo. Artemis' attention is available to all. She comes to assist legitimate and illegitimate deliveries, the births of human children and the births of animal young. She's a female-identified goddess especially concerned with the particularities of female bodily existence, with being born and giving birth, with the onset of menstruation at puberty and its cessation at menopause, with the loss of virginity and with death. Her mysteries are blood mysteries, those female sheddings of blood which are a given part of female functioning, not wounds in any ordinary sense. And yet, wounds from which we may die. Birth in Artemis's realm is itself a moment when death hovers near. How likely it is the child or mother or both might perish. Artemis, the agent of such death, also stands ready then to nurse the orphan, be it human child or wolf cub or fawn at her own breast. As goddess of the forest, Artemis is a huntress but she's also hunted. Her virginity is that of the vulnerable, vulnerable maiden whose very unavailability is seen as enticement. Though she herself has the power to resist her would-be ravishers, she cannot prevent their pursuing her. It is easy to see her as a wounding goddess. She is pitiless towards those she considers strong enough to have the capacity to protect themselves. 
yet she is fully available to those who are not. Though all the goddesses have some relation to healing, I see the two celebrated in the Eleusinian mysteries, Demeter and Persephone, as most intimately connected to my theme. Demeter was the goddess associated with the blessings and griefs of motherhood. Her self separated from her own mother at birth. When she had a daughter of her own, she longed to give her all the motherly love of which she had herself been deprived. Not surprisingly, Demeter could not imagine that there could be a surfeit of maternal devotion. No more surprisingly, the most important story about Demeter and her daughter Persephone is one that tells of Demeter's loss of that beloved child when she becomes a marriageable maiden. You all know the story. One spring day, Persephone goes to play in a flower-filled maiden with several other young women. That night, she doesn't come home. Eventually, Demeter learns that Persephone had reached to pluck an especially large and beautiful narcissus. The whole plant had come up as she pulled, and out of the ever-widening hole made by the torn-up roots had appeared Hades, god of the underworld. He'd gathered the maiden in his arms and carried her down to his underworld realm. Demeter is overcome with anger and grief over the loss of her daughter. So all-consuming is her rage that she neglects her responsibilities to assure the growth of those crops on which human lives and the human capacity to serve the gods depend. And so eventually, Zeus has to intervene to allow Persephone to return to her mother, not permanently, not on the same basis as before her abduction, but for a good part of each year. The rites associated with Persephone focus on the reunion and on Persephone as bride of Hades. But the Thesmophoria, Demeter's own ritual, focuses on her loss and grief. Once a year, married women left their husbands and children to spend three days in Demeter's temple. They prayed for children and easy births. They indulged in obscene language and vulgar behavior. They felt free to share not only their passive grief, but their active rage, much as women did in consciousness-raising groups a decade or so ago. <laughs> Demeter was the goddess who knew how much of motherhood is pain and loss. To share one's wounds with her, and to know how truly they were shared by the other women participants, was to receive some assuagement of the pain. The goddess could not undo the loss any more than she could undo her own, but she could initiate one into its archetypal and sacred dimensions. Her daughter Persephone, the goddess of the underworld and of death, may paradoxically be the most important of all Greek images of the wounded healer. I think so. For what Persephone offers is healing of our fear of woundedness and vulnerability, our fear of finitude and death. Herself abducted by Hades, she comes to love him. Herself taken to the underworld against her will, she comes to be its queen. Even the god of the underworld, Hades, had, as we noted above, suffered a grievous wound, so serious that only a god could recover from it. The Greeks saw the underworld as the place where psyches live. They saw Persephone's mysteries at Eloisus as the rituals whereby one learned that entering Hades might be blessing rather than curse. What they had rituals to help them learn, we may need to learn from our own experiences of being wounded. Release from what may be the most serious illness of all. This is what the Greeks had their rituals for, that we may have to learn from our own experience, that release from what may be the most serious illness of all, which I take to be the fantasy of a health without wounds, a life without death.